Yeah, there have been a lot of money spent on those. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any further? Anybody forget anything they needed to report? Okay, uh, I don't see any elected officials report. Uh, county administrator report. Okay. Uh, I've got a couple of announcements, and I'll start with our building official. I don't think he's able to make it, but uh, you all received this by email. He has been, uh, Jeff Whitney, uh, appointed to serve as a member of a uh, DAPA, which is Division of Occupational and Professional Licensing, and it's specific to the Professional Engineers and Professional Land Surveyors Licensing Board. And what's really cool about that is that the appointment is made by the State Department of Commerce in concurrence with Governor Herbert. And government, Governor Herbert did, in fact, endorse Jeff's appointment. It's a four-year appointment, and it is all about, of course, protecting interests of people of Utah with regard to licensing. So I think that's uh, worth announcing aloud. And if I can indulge you a few more minutes, I have another very special presentation. Well, not a presentation, but an announcement about an award that you've heard about from by EMS, Search and Rescue, and, and Classic Air Medical. We have several of you all here. Would you guys come on up? And I just, I want to give a little uh, information about the, how this, um, what this, what this award is really all about. I think I'm going to go to that podium so I can have a better mic. Come, come on up so the council can see you guys. Maybe right along here. Thank you so much. Um, and there are more. Andy, you can come up too. This is your... You had something to do with this? So uh, so Andy Smith, our director of EMS, um, made a nomination to uh, the state uh, for award. And the award came back. I, I attended the award ceremony last week. They uh, earned EMS, Search and Rescue, and Classic Air Medical earned the outstanding performance in an emergency medical incident. This was... Um, so I'll, I'll name the people. I want to be sure and do that. Out of EMS, we had McKay Vowles, Mark Markham, Brittany Baston, who's here, uh, and Robin Reibold. I don't know. Okay. Uh, Search and Rescue, we had Bert Sherman, Craig Sanchez, Seamus Hennigan, Mike Cornella, Wade Plafkin, Frank Mendonca, Nadi Ardalan. I don't know if I said that right, Tom Schellenberger, Nate Jones, Aaron Looney Triggs, and Michael Kirby. And... It, with Classic Air Medical, we had Cody Henderson, pilot, Craig Campbell, an RN, and Jake Bell Blackwelder. Here he is, paramedic. Uh, so you can get an idea, a flavor of what it took with this rescue, and it was a base jumping incident. It occurred uh, September 2nd of last year. Uh, so at 1956, so what is that? What time in the evening is that? I can't calculate. Seven, 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 About 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, it wound up being an 11-hour, is that right? 11-hour? Yeah, a little more more than 11 hour situation. Um, so just so you guys can really hear about this. And the award was presented by the Utah Department of Health, the Division of Family Health and Preparedness, and the Bureau of Emergency Medical Service and Preparedness. Uh, the new EMS Special Service District Chair also attended. That is Liz Tubbs, by the way. Um, so I won't read all the details, but uh, as I mentioned, a base jumping accident occurred uh, off the lower Gemini Bridges Road in Moab. Uh, the base jumper hit the wall and had a par partial sh chute collapse. This resulted in an accelerated free fall from 400 feet. He had friends there who witnessed it, hiked off the cliff, made a makeshift tourniquet. He had a partially amputated leg. Can you imagine the pain of this patient? Captain McKay Bowles, he's not here, is he? No. He oh, comes here comes another. Here. Come on up, come on up. Perfect timing. Hey, All right. So uh, McKay Valls happened to be in the incident due to another call he was on, and so he was uh, um, next on the scene, first on the scene were these friends of the patient. They shined a light. Uh, so we're talking about, <laughs> you, you recognize the area, the cliff. Okay, the patient was at the top of this 600-foot scree field, which is very hard to scramble across, averaging a 50-degree slope, very steep. Uh, the ascent was very difficult with loose, large boulders, no clear path directly to the patient. Robin, uh, not here, an EMT, and Brittany Bastion, paramedic, she's, you've seen her before, <laughs> uh, were the next to arrive on scene. And uh, Robin and McKay Valls were the very first to complete the, the difficult scramble, climb up to the patient. Um, they saw that the friends of the patient had covered uh, the patient in a parachute to keep him warm. The patient was calm, but obviously in a great amount of pain. 
Then the second round of rescuers uh, that made it to the patient included search and rescue members, as well as uh, Brittany here and Mark Markham, who you know from Thompson Fire and our, G4, our, our fire warden. Uh, let's see, a medical hel helicopter uh, was requested. Classic Air was able to land at the command post. And uh, this is where Jake Blackwelder comes in. He used to be an e EMT with us. Well, is that right? The right way to say it? it used to be? Still is. Still is. <laughs> okay. He's, let me place. Okay, good. Medical health helicopter was requested. Classic Air landed. Due to the patient's location and being only uh, feet, just a few feet from the 400-foot cliff, the helicopter crew, which was Jake and nurse Craig Campbell, had to make this difficult climb and hike up to the patient. So uh, search and rescue wound up having to place a lot of bolts using a hammer drill <clears throat> for several hundred feet along the base of the cliff. They found the most accessible route down was to traverse 200 feet across the scree field so that the angle was not as steep for the lowering. Um, by the way, this was written by Andy Smith, who this was part of the nomination for this award. Um, let's see, they had to think about food, water, medical supplies, and rope gear and the, the best way to deliver, to deliver it to the patient, and that they determined it would be by helicopter. Uh, the helicopter had to get as close as safely possible to the cliff, hover close to the ground, uh, while a search and rescue member in the helicopter would then pass down the bags of equipment to the rescuer, rescuers who were huddled on the scree field. Anyway, moving the patient obviously became very difficult. This is a per patient in very, very much pain, bleeding. A second tourniquet had to be placed on the, the patient. It was extremely slow and difficult to move the patient uh, you know, across these loose rocks in a steep grade. Um, let's see. Search and rescue wound up having to switch on to a new system uh, for lowering the patient down because they, they were only able to move 75 feet in one hour. And they had so much to go. How so se only 75 feet in one hour, if I understand this right. So around 1 a.m. in the morning, the decision was made to place, uh, place everything on hold until a, a fresh helicopter, fresh staff could come in and hoist out the patient. Now that helicopter wasn't classic. That was Department of Public Safety. So, so during that next six hours while, while they're waiting till morning, uh, they were constantly having to work for, with pain control and fluid management to keep the patient stabilized. Um, let's see, so uh, around seven in the morning, um, that's when the hoist helicopter arrived and uh, lifted off with the, with the rescue technician onto the hoist. You see this in the movies, right? James Bond, right? Lowered him down to the rescuer and to the patient. So this is how, how the, they manage this. Um, they get the patient loaded into their hoist bag, they call it, and uh, the helicopter comes in, hoist the patients and rescuer out. Let's see. It turned out even that was much more difficult than they anticipated because of the proximity of the helicopter to the cliff face. Um, the helicopter held a steady hover with only about 50 feet from the cliff face. The patient was hoisted successfully down to a third helicopter, and that included another classic air medical crew. Um, that first medical air, classic air crew had been uh, on scene throughout the night, <clears throat> and that's when they decided that fresh flight crew would come in. So the patient was ultimately flown to St. Mary's, and the patient's leg was sur surgically amputated. He spent seven days in ICU, and of course he gave us a release to be able to share this story. Uh, Andy, is there anything you would add or correct? No, I, just, I want to point out that our, our um, yeah, I mean, he would absolutely be dead uh, if our first crews that arrived on scene, McKay, Brittany, and Robin, didn't um, go outside of their scope of allowed practice and, and administer a uh, vasopressor uh, in a different dose range than we're allowed to. And, uh, may I may I just interject? And that was done under the purview of Dr. Murdoch? Yeah, so that's, okay. that's, I think it's very important to understand that uh, medical guidelines are flexible and need to be flexible for situations like this. Um, it is now in our scope of practice, but at the time it wasn't. And so it wasn't something that they were technically allowed to do until we made a phone call. But, uh, I think it's important to understand that these, these types of incidents and these calls are not that uncommon. Uh, we probably hoisted it. I don't know, Jake, last few years, I've, I've been on center or seven voice, yeah, uh, just myself, uh, you know, long time, 12 hour, eight hour incidents, we just had another one the other night out in um, ice dive, eight and a half hours, 
Um, and so I, I think it's just really important to understand the amount of work that these gentlemen do and, and ladies and also the, the really tight integration with our search and rescue team is so important and the support and the work that we do together. It's, it's a very unique area. It's a very unique area to be an EMT and a paramedic and our SAR team and the integration that we have to have is just incredible. And they, just do, they do such a fantastic job. And, and having the support from Classic, those guys, I've never been on a, I mean, I've worked in multiple other areas across the state, and uh, I've never had a helicopter crew on the high of 50 degree slope to go treat a patient. So uh, they usually like the comfort of their seats and uh, like to keep going with a large jet engine. And so, uh, you know, those two willing to make that hike up there really helped our crew and supported them, and, and they worked together to manage that patient all through the night. But uh, he's happy to be alive, and um, he's, uh, he's jumping again on legs. So I want to just say thank you so much, all of you. Um, I'd, I'd like it if you would say your name and your credential to, before you leave. And I know that uh, there were other, there were lots of others. Uh, and I apologize, this was a last minute request to uh, have you here. And so thank you again. But if you'd say your name and your credential, thank you. I'm Chris Canning, Advanced CMT. I'm Brittany Bastion, I'm paramedic. Jake Blackwelder, flight paramedic. Sonia Glazer, paramedic. Liz Harden, paramedic. Brett Sherman, Advanced CMT. Jordan Mustard, Advanced CMT. Excellent. Um, and Brett was on site as the uh, primary search and rescue. Oh, oh, you know, sort of oh covering both. Oh, thank you for that. Yes. If you would let search and rescue know, too, that we were able to do this for you on behalf of Absolutely. all of you all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. I'm sorry we're sweating. We've been on a lot of calls this morning. <laughs> Diana, did you have anything to report? Um, I do have one thing, Marianne. I'd like to, to um, like a call on you on the 1st of August, which is a Wednesday, maybe about 9 a.m. I'm going to be hosting the clerks and auditors throughout the state here. Oh, how And if you could come and welcome them, August I'd appreciate that. 1st? I'll, I'll get you all the details. Okay. I'll put it 9 a.m.? Mm -hmm. I'll put it now because otherwise I want to make sure I have it. Anything else? I so far have about 20 counties of the 29th that will be attending. And Thank lots you. of other support from the State Auditor and Tax Commission. It's going to be a nod. Yes, I will be there. Thank you. Anybody else? I don't see any other elected officials. Thank you, Diana. Okay, we have our uh, code enforcement quarterly report, Caitlin Myers. Gets pulled up. I'll start. Um, this is the regularly regularly scheduled code enforcement quarterly update for quarter two of 2018. Great. Okay. So quarter two, um, I was the lead through all of this quarter. So in quarter one, I took on. Um, the primary role of code enforcement um, it for Grand County um, and had to do a little bit of catch up and so now quarter two is kind of my first full quarter leading code enforcement. So we had 51 violation cases, uh, resolved most of them. There are a few that are still open that we started in quarter one or quarter two and are continuing into quarter three. And we sent two cases to the county attorney's office after going through our code enforcement protocol. Um, to start handling on the legal side for prosecution. 
So breaking those down, um, this is a slightly different uh, pie chart. This is shows 53, but a uh, vast majority of them are still um, related to short-term rentals. Um, and we have, again, a handful of cases that are related to junk and debris and illegal RV camping in the county. Um, and two of those cases, I, um, I collaborated in general on three cases with Cole Cloward from the building department. Um, we co-signed three separate letters for three separate case violations. Um, and two of those were um, the construction without a permit. Um, one was construction without a permit related to an ADU in someone's backyard that they were using as an overnight rental. And the other was um, construction of uh, an RV pad without a permit in someone's house that they were using, um, not for a short-term rental, but for a long-term rental. Um, so, yeah. So, is this, are you still doing this on a complaint basis? I mean, in the past we've had presentations on our code enforcement is, based, is, is a complaint basis. So someone files right. a complaint with you. Then you go investigate that. Is that true for all of those categories? Um, not for all of them. For short-term rentals, we are proactively um, pursuing those. Uh, we use a software called STR Helper. And so it's this online database that basically goes through and rakes all of the short-term rental listing sites. Um, and so we are proactively. So that's why a huge chunk um, pretty consistently of these reports is going to be related to short-term rentals. Um, because everything else we are doing complaint-based, um, some of them are cases that other um, county employees have brought to me, but for the most part I'm not going out and actively, um, you know, cataloging violations. So, okay. Thank you. Yep. yeah. Um, then just a further breakdown of short-term rentals, um, the vast majority of them are still just ones that don't have a business license and weren't aware that they needed one or their new rentals um, that were listing before coming in and getting the proper permitting. Um, there were a few that were expired business licenses from um, properties where the short or the property management was not um, proactively getting those business licenses and was expecting the property owner themselves to do it. So um, we're just continuing. I'm working with Jana and Diana to kind of continue to work on communication about that. Um, there still are a handful that are in illegal residential areas um, and several that are related to um, RV, people trying to rent out RVs, and um, that specifically is one of the cases that we have sent to the county attorney's office for prosecution is um, someone trying to do short-term rental RVs in their backyard. So um, just taking a quick snapshot of um, SDR Helper, this is straight from my computer from about a week ago when I was making this presentation, so it's a little more updated on numbers from um, beginning of July since we started Q3. Um, I can tell you that as of about an hour ago, we are now up to 20 non-compliant rentals just because new ones are coming online every week still. So 29 not compliant? 20. We have 20, yeah, we have 19 um, out of the th almost 400 um, in the county that are not compliant. So those are either they don't have a business license and or they are um, in an improper zone. So um, so to explain the process of how the software works, um, it will find listings online. And so it's um, my job to go in and investigate and validate these properties. So that's the, the gauge on the left-hand side. So I'll go in and look at a listing and try and match it to a property. And then once that's matched with a property um, that has a database of a lot of our business licenses in the system. And so if there's not an active business license in the system, it comes up as non-compliant. Um, so we are continuing to work on um, developing this process. We are down 40 um, 
from the end of Q1 to the end of Q2. So we are um, we're getting there. And even today, um, I haven't gotten confirmation from Jana yet because she's out of town and she's usually the one that sends me updates of new short-term rentals as they come into the clerk's office. Um, but as of my account of new business licenses that I've signed up on um, since even taking these screenshots, we're down to more like 16. Um, so people are still pretty consistently coming in and so we're, we're continuously writing letters and having people come in and get business licenses. So. Hopefully, by the end of the year, we'll be under 10, um, and we'll be, or we'll be down to zero. We'll see. Um, so we're continuing to work on it. Um, the number of properties that need to be investigated have gone up since quarter one um, because there are some new properties. There are a lot of new um, Rim Village, Rim Vista units that are coming online that aren't programmed into the system yet. And so the listings are coming online, but there's not a property to match them. So um, we're working on kind of developing those properties in the, the system. So that's part of the reason why those numbers went up. Um, as of uh, counting the fees that we have collected, um, we have collected over $10,000 in fees related to short-term rentals. Um, and uh, about a third of those are organic fees that were collected, but the vast majority of them are due to enforcement efforts. Um, so we collected, um, so just a breakdown of the actual numbers, it's 36 business licenses collected due to enforcement and four um, or five organic business licenses. So 41 business licenses in this quarter that came on um, and 23 overnight rental applications um, and 19 of those were uh, due to code enforcement. And um, a big reason why we had a, a big jump in this quarter for um, enforcement efforts was because we finally were able to contact a lot of these property management companies that had, um, like one, for example, was a property manager in Red Cliffs that had 14 units that had just come online and they were um, unaware that they needed to get a business license. So we were able to get those, a huge chunk of those and a huge chunk of a couple of other property management companies. Um, so now we're just kind of picking away at a few of the standalone rentals. So. Um, just general takeaways for this quarter. I think that um, in a lot of ways our protocol works really well. Um, and we're st I'm still working out a lot of the kinks um, in just my own system of how to make this work. But for the most part, it works really well. And I've heard um, kind of feedback from the community that um, people in the county are realizing that the county is starting to actually enforce um, the land use code and so rumors are getting out and so I think some people are starting to manage that themselves which is really great. Um, we, I have been working a lot still with the building department. Cole has been really great to work with and um, he and I have both been pretty proactive in involving each other. Um, obviously the other guys in the building department have also been a huge help but Cole's kind of been, become their point person for a lot of the code enforcement that they're doing. Um, and I'm also working with um, Jana and Diana and Debbie in the assessors in the clerk's office as well. And um, a little bit with Kelly in the travel council. She's still trying to um, figure out some of her systems of how they're enforcing TRT. But um, as a, a collective, I think that we're starting to work really well together. Um, I think that there's definitely a huge need still countywide to go digital with like e-signatures and um, some of our um, applications and so that's something that we are still working with Matt on with IT to try and um, you know increase efficiency instead of having to go around all the departments and chase signatures so uh, we're working on that. Um, and in general, I think that I would just say that um, we are doing a really good job on our end of following our protocol and have sent several, we have gone through several um, second notice violation letters 
and most of those resolve and two of them have been sent to the county attorneys and I haven't heard word from the county attorney's office about the state of either of those case, cases so I don't really know um, where they have gone from here but I feel like on on our departments and we're starting to really get into the groove with this so thank do you have you. any questions thank you questions this is a wonderful report. I'm so impressed. Thanks. Evan? Glad you're doing it. Keep it up. Yes. Thanks. It is not the most glamorous part of my job. Well, the increase in but fees is definitely appreciated. So. Yeah, the revenue. You're paying for yourself. Yeah. Paying for the added yeah. money. Trying. <laughs> well, right. since you mentioned that, Madam Chair, you all know Kaylin is the one who uh, completed some applications while Zachariah was on vacation for the business expansion and retention. Yeah. $30,000? came in or will be coming in for that and then yeah, another 24,000 yeah I can I can give it a brief update since well department report I guess um, so I don't know if this is the moment the time to do that well, I just I'm wanted excited to, to hear I don't know so our department worked on two applications for the go ads business incentive uh, business expansion and retention grant um, and GOAD changed the way their grants were set up this year instead of having kind of like a, a rubric of things that you could do with the grant. Um, they opened it up and said, submit a project to us, tell us your budget, tell us your timeline, and we will give you money based on that. So, um, so this is the first time that they've really piloted this type of grant. And so we applied um, on behalf of the county and behalf of the city. Um, asking for $30,000 for each entity. Um, for the county, we have received $27,000 um, for basically a three-pronged workforce development effort, um, and that includes funding for a new, basically, master technology skills development course that we are working on doing for the community. Um, and that's actually, um, we are hoping to have Emily Campbell, who's on our planning commission, who works for a tech development company. She's going to be uh, the teacher of that course. So we're really excited about that. Um, we also got funding f to support the annual business summit. And we have additional funding from the county's grant application for just general um, business expansion and um, kind of training support to offer to local businesses in the community. And then on the city side, for that application, we received $24,000 to do um, kind of a, a feasibility study um, of our commercial real estate market so that we can start assessing um, kind of how we can start really using the TIF money from the CRA to um, best serve our businesses and start doing some business um, incentive packages here. Um, so we're really excited about both of them. We heard more recently from James Dixon that um, they are considering increasing both of those funding amounts. Um, and they have asked on the city end that they provide a little bit more information. But um, as of right now, we know that we got $51,000 in general for the, the Moab area, which is um, by far and away the most that we've gotten from there in the past. So we're really excited to move forward with developing some of this programming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Cool. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Berlin. The uh, Grand Center Department Report. Okay. In 2017, we had 199 events at the center and did brought in 13,562 in revenue and as the seniors we did um, we provided 12,983 meals to 195 unduplicated individuals over 60 home delivered was 15,857 meals to 102 homebound individuals and our transportation we did 3,000 18 one-way rides for three, 35 unduplicated riders. And then our trips last year were um, to Durango, and they rode the train to Silverton. They went to the Gateway Canyons to the museum and down to the Needles. 
and then they play cards, exercise, and um, we do blood pressure once a month, and Rocky Mountain Home Care does provides a natal toenail clinic, and so we had 104 that participated. And we help with Medicare issues, signing up for Part D plans, or billing issues, and we helped 31 last year. And it's signed up for Social Security. Beautiful. Questions? Yes. Yes. Curious. Um, thank you for providing the 2016 numbers. <laughs> I love to compare. Um, I'm just curious as to your feel on, you know, it looks like the number of participants has gone down slightly in most categories. Is that because people are exiting this world or? Mm -hmm. um, it is. Okay. Yeah. And they're slower getting newer ones coming. So I mean, like today we had three that have never been there before. So it just depends. It's pretty yeah. impressive stuff you do. The lovely center. It feels really nice over there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, museum report, John uh, Foster. year um, and we've had I guess for about eight months now um, three full-time staff people um, we have two part-time in admin and education uh, and then we have our um, receptionist folks up front so I think the total staff is around eight now, when, well, several years ago, it was basically one full-time, no other part-times than the front desk staff. So things have picked up a little bit recently. Um, for the mid-year report here, what I wanted to do is basically show where we're at and then compare. I started comparing to last year and then started throwing in some previous years because um, there are, I guess, some some trends to some of the uh, different numbers that we have here. Um, for example, you can see on, on the first page here we have the attendance, which we are a little over 5,500 right now this year. You can see we're already ahead of a couple of previous years full totals. Um, so we're on track to have a pretty good year in terms of overall attendance. One thing I wanted to emphasize here on the bottom of the first page was the numbers for programming specifically. Um, we were pretty low for, for a few years. 2015 approximately is when Andrea Stoughton took over again doing the education program. She'd been away, I think, two or three years at that point. Um, but you can see that she's, through the past three or four years, three and a half years, really picked up the number of students that we've reached in the education program. And so far this year, she's almost hit last year's total for the 12th month period. Um, we also had um, marketing and development directors starting late 2017 which has helped our special events we have more of the special events they're better advertised and so we're again at this point in terms of attendance on the special events almost to last year's uh, 12 month total 
Um, on the second page, in terms of our earned income, which is essentially the admissions, membership, gift shop, uh, and the entrance donations, um, this is comparing where we are this year at this point to our budget that we set up for the year. Um, we're about where we'd like to be in the approximately in the middle of the year on membership and uh, entrance donations and admissions and gift shop are actually doing pretty well overall. Um, the bottom of the second page there just shows a breakdown again of, of our how our income is distributed. The county contribution is always is, is fairly important. Um, and then our, our earned income breakdown there, admissions and the membership gift shop are, are particularly important as well. Finally, on the third page there, we've had some volunteers that have been starting to help us out uh, cataloging new objects, new photographs, and new documents and books that we get in to the collections. Uh, particularly starting last year and so you can see just the total number of new entries in our, our catalog has increased significantly um, in the past three years uh, we're already at our highest total so far this year um, in July that ought to continue we did particularly well for earlier years in 2015 because we actually had a grant through the Utah Division of Arts and Museums and we had for approximately four months we had a, a paid person cataloging and doing um, collections work for us on the bottom there just uh, the volunteers these are volunteers who have worked out in our paleo lab in the back which has been pretty popular with visitors getting a chance to watch the um, bones and other fossils coming out of the rock. Volunteers also work in the collections and uh, helping us out with various aspects of the work. This, we started tracking a, a few years ago and it has increased significantly, particularly in the past two years and uh, this year we're on track to surpass last year's total pretty well also. Um, so that is it um, for our mid-year report. Again, thanks for the council's support over the years. Um, I've enjoyed, enjoyed working at the museum and with everyone. Um, I actually have to get to a meeting with our realtor, um, but Late this year, um, either a replacement director or our interim person will be doing the report for uh, the 2018 full year. So, thank you again. And thank you. Yeah. You'll be missed. Thanks, Laura. Thank you very much. And we are to the part section of the agenda where citizens to be heard on an item that is not on the agenda. If uh, you want to speak on an item on an agenda on the agenda please fill out this form do we have any citizens that would like to speak on an item that is not on the agenda okay there are no presentations okay we have item M approving proposal for services for previous umtra liaison to provide assistance and train and in Coming Umtra Liaison. John West, Zachariah. Okay, uh, so um, in an ideal world, we would have uh, identified a qualified candidate and offered that candidate a, uh, an employment opportunity with the county, and that candidate would have accepted you know, two months ago um, for these positions so that we could have some overlap between um, the individual who's held this position for several years and has done an excellent job uh, and then the new person uh, because there's a tremendous amount to learn about the project and about the technical information 
associated with that project, but uh, we don't live in an ideal world all the time, and so um, we weren't able to uh, find someone uh, to, to uh, fill the UMTRA liaison and technical inspector position uh, until today. And we have extended an offer, and that offer was accepted, and so we do have someone who will be uh, replacing uh, Lee, uh, but uh, we don't know exactly what day they can start, and even if they can start Monday, that would only leave us a couple of weeks uh, while Lee is still with us. Lee's last day um, is actually the um, day of the steering committee meeting for the UMTRA project on July 31st. And so what you have in front of you is, is um, a proposal that uh, John and myself and Lee uh, you know, put together. Uh, Lee, Lee drafted it and John and I reviewed it and, and felt that it was very reasonable. And the, the proposal is really to support um, you know, a transition period where uh, Lee can provide uh, basically contract services um, in the form of advising the new uh, UMTRA liaison and technical inspector. And so uh, we wanted to get that um, sort of approach approved by the county council. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the, the long-term outcome, you know, will more than pay for itself in terms of uh, the service to, to the citizens of Grand County and to the County Council. Um, we have checked my budget and uh, we don't have any concerns about uh, overdrawing from what was already uh, approved and allocated in the, in the 2018 budget. Um, there are funds that are unexpended in the grant uh, that pays for half of, of Lee's position, at least the UMTRA side. And then there are some additional cost savings in, in the salary line item in my office uh, simply because um, a longtime employee who is our planning and zoning administrator was replaced by now someone who's at a much lower step. So uh, no budget issues at all here. This is really um, intended to, to provide as smooth a transition as possible. Question? I just wonder if we need to, I'm glad you gave that budget um, update, that's good to know. I just wonder if we need to make the motion with a not to exceed amount and what reasonable amount that would be. I mean, it's also good to know that we do have a replacement, so I don't anticipate any issues. But. Yeah. Uh, I think a not to exceed limit would be reasonable, although I don't have that number in front. I don't have a number with me today. Um, so, Diana, do you know how much is available in the grant? We have 5,500 available in the payroll savings. Yeah. In the payroll savings, just due to the. In the grant. Yeah. So we could put it not to exceed 10,000, and I, I can't imagine we're even close to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I move to approve the proposal for services for previous UMTRA liaison to provide assistance and train the incoming UMTRA liaison not to exceed. Oh, in the amount of not to exceed ten thousand dollars. Do I have? Yeah. <coughs> Do I have a second? Oh, and authorize the chair to sign all associated documents. Motion by Jay Lynn, Second. seconded by Patrick Trim. Any further questions? Are you free to say who was hired? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he is not. <laughs> he hasn't signed it's, all the paperwork. It's okay, a, so, so we'll announce it later. We'll announce it later. Okay. Yeah, well, well, just we curious. should have it by tomorrow, though. So <laughs> okay. you can call me later tomorrow afternoon. I asked Lee earlier today. Are you afraid we're going to warn Well, you never know what could happen. <laughs> you don't know until the, ne until the final, right. you know, the final document has been signed. <laughs> okay, motion by Jay Lynn Hawk, seconded by Patrick Trim. Any further questions? 
Seeing none, I call for a vote. All in favor? Passes five to zero. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Approving bid award for the construction of concrete ramp at Sand Flats Recreation Area. Andrea. Work. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's picking it up or not. I don't have a picture of a snow scene on my laptop. Is it plugged in? Yeah, I just plugged the this part in. I don't know. And do you know her? I don't know why it's got this black line. Oh, I can give it without the pictures, but I don't know why it's not reading it. Oh, she grabs that one in. I heard he was the expert. All right, well, I can go ahead without it. Um, so thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to come before you today. Uh, this is similar to what we did in December of 2017. You may recall I came before you for approval for, um, I guess it was consent agenda actually because it was under 10,000. So um, there was approval from the council in December to do a concrete ramp for the entrance to Hell's Revenge. And so what I'm trying to do now is a second concrete ramp next to it where the exit comes out. If you recall, we built that new exit um, next to the trailhead and so we had the same problem on this side as we had before we have sand and cobble coming into the cobbles the problem and other rocks coming into the parking lot damaging the parking lot the asphalt so I'm coming before you today to uh, hopefully approve a bid for um, straight line contracting for twelve thousand um, or is it eight hundred and seventy five dollars or eight hundred ninety five dollars um, for them to do the project. We had it in the paper as required. Uh, we had a mandatory pre-bid meeting on site. Jeff Whitney accompanied me and we only had one representative attend and that was from Straight Line Contracting. And they turned in the bid. Um, the bid is actually a dollar yes, uh, less per square foot than what we paid in December with a different contractor. So it came in less than I expected so we're well within budget. And um, the project will start uh, next week, if approved, and um, be completed in time for Labor Day weekend, August 28th. Um, but they, I mean, it's only going to take one to two weeks. And then something I don't have on here that I that I should have is that I've already talked to the BLM. There's no problem with us taking the uh, entrance fin that people have been using for eons, and that will become the entrance and exit fin again for just the two weeks that the project happens and then we'll go back. And this time of year, we don't have um, a high volume of use, so it, it shouldn't cause any problems. And we'll get a notice out to all the outfitters and everyone a week before or more when the project starts. Oh, thank you, Zephyria. Okay. So, yeah, that's okay, I guess. Madam Chair, I, I move to approve the proposed bid and contract agreement between Grand County and Straight Line Contracting for the construction of a concrete, concrete ex entrance ramp at the Sand Flats Recreational Area is presented and authorized the chair to, s to sign on all contract and associated documents. Actually, it's the ramp. It's new. Oh, exit ramp. Yeah. Sorry, it was the boilerplate from, <laughs> not a boilerplate, but from the last one. And then yeah, when I, I just said, I still added the amount, I realized I had a mistake there from before. Okay. Well, a, a motion by Patrick Cream, seconded by Roy Paxman. Any further discussion? He I beat have, you to the punch. I have one question. <laughs> yes. Um, did you anticipate that you'd need an exit ramp at the time you installed the egg entrance ramp? Yes. Yes, but if you recall, we hadn't built, the county had not built the road yet for the new exit. Oh, okay. So, okay. and we didn't have time to put that ramp in for opening for Jeep Safari. So I knew I was going to have to come back and do it either this summer or this winter. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Because yeah. normally if you do them together, you get a better cost, you know, because the, well, the contractor's there. But right, if you couldn't right. do it, you know, I understand that. Mm -hmm. so, you end up getting a better cost. 
second. I think I did get a better cost, though, yeah. so I, I lucked out <laughs> in this scenario anyway. But I, I agree, I would have liked to have done a both, but we didn't. We weren't there yeah, yet. No, that's understandable. Have you worked with straight line before? No. The county has definitely used sure. straight line. Okay. Well, yeah. okay. It's been good. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, we got it on the screen. We need to find out what the magic answer is. Oh, here's how. Anyway, it's fine. That's how the other one looked anything? before we concreted it. And that's how it looks today, working very well. And then just to go through, that's what it looks like right now. So that's what we will have concreted. Thank you. Just up to that point, right? Well, actually, um, behind the, the exit revenge. sign, there is <laughs> no. Behind the exit <laughs> sign, there's there's boulders. Um, behind the white exit sign, you see boulders. Yeah. So actually, it will come up and make a curve and go a little bit. Um, it'll go 55 feet further in, and then under the gravel, oh, okay. um, tapered so that we have they meet well. Yeah. And, okay. So. Any other? Okay. All in favor? Passes five to zero. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Item O. Oh. Approving. Unbudgeted funding for the Tamarisk Beetle Program to continue the mortality study of the Tamarisk. Tam Higgs, lead supervisor. Okay, when Wright gave the presentation at the last council meeting, we were talking that we really didn't have um, you know, funding to be able to continue with the mortality. Um, the Forestry Fire and State Land said they could come up with $2,500 for for Wright and, and one other person to be able to help do the, you know, the mortality trend studies. Um, and you've got the letter from the Forestry Fire and State Lands, you know, stating that. Um, I think the other, he said 5000 in the letter, but two of that is going to be an open bill contract directly with, with Tim Graham to do the, um, the Tamaris beetle itself, just the movement of the beetles and where they're at. I know he's got other funding from other sources to be able to start doing some of that. But we're just trying to be able to continue this right here because it's something that's, you know, that we've got more data than, you know, in one geographical area than anybody else in the country. And we, and as long as Wright's able to be able to be here, he's got the expertise. He's been doing it since 2007. And it's been fine-tuned by talking to some other people from other universities on how to be able to do this. And... It would be nice to help him continue, and we have it continuous, and that way they're, they have to find a job somewhere else and take off on there. So that way we still have some continuity with how the data is collected. Thank you. May I just point yes. out, on the dais is uh, an abstract. Um, I believe it's University of Denver, isn't it? It's is it the University of Denver writing this? Uh, yeah, um, Anna Scher, Dr. Anna Scher, and our, our own Wright Robinson are, are credited among a few others. And I want to point you to the uh, first paragraph of the abstract where it's yellow highlighted. Uh, it's worth pointing out uh, that they're st stating in this publication, between 2013 and 2016, Tamarisk dive back was assessed at 79 sites across Grand County. And this is, matches what Tim is saying. They're saying Grand County is arguably the epicenter of Diarabda. Am I saying it right? That's the Tamarisk leaf beetle, uh, the impact in the whole country, this county, and this program. So, I know when we talked about this at the Weed Board, we uh, all we, we all voted for it. We really want to be able to keep this grant going. Um, I just wasn't sure where we were going to pull the money from to keep keep it going. So that's that was my question: is where are we going to get the funding for the rest of it? Because I don't think it's budgeted, right? It's, it right. says within budget at the fiscal impact. And it says unbudgeted. That's a little confusing. I was on vacation. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Well, is it budgeted or not? No, it's not. It's not budgeted for. It's, it. it's unbudgeted, but but. Your budget covered, is that what that means? Well, this budget, our budget for the county, we department does not include this. 
So this is something that we're just asking if there's, I know that there's some discretionary funds. So we're just seeing if the council would be willing to contribute. I think it's $5,814 of about the $8,000 it's going to take to do the project. So there's a request for council discretionary funds right. of 5800 did you say? Right, 5814 And 14 Yeah. Dollars? <laughs> okay. So that's that's actually the request, and prob and I would recommend the motion. Out of discretionary funds, would that be good, Diana? Yeah, or we could always amend Tim's budget during the process. Mm -hmm. I'd rather see that. Just amend his budget yeah, when it comes. Then yeah. we know where it went. Right. Exactly. Then it's clear we just on. Have to take it out of discretionary, right? Yeah. So let's move to amend the budget. Is that yes? So I'd like to make a motion. I move to I move to approve the the amendment of the weed control department's budget for up to five thousand eight hundred fourteen dollars for the mortality study on tamarisk caused by the tamarisk beetle and to authorize the chair to sign and initial all associated documents. I second that. Further discussion? Yes. I'm just still confused about the math. Um, I mean, the forestry letter says they will do, they will give five thousand dollars, and then you said that within that five thousand dollars, they're going to directly contract with Tim Graham. Right. There'll be twenty-five hundred of that. Five thousand would come. Right. For us, and then the other twenty-five would be contracted with Tim Graham. <laughs> And then in the agenda summary, it says up to 5814, 5, so we may be able to do the sites again. 2500 will be going to Dr. Tim Graham, so that makes it sound like the county's, part of the county's 5800 will be going to Tim Graham. Well, I'm not, no, it, would, it wouldn't be going from there. I'm just, I was trying to bet it, and it probably didn't work very well trying to be able to say that we want Tim Graham to be somewhat separate as a separate contract with them so he's not really working under the direction of the weed department that way there he can use his own vehicle and do whatever because I don't know what other funding he has I know it's from with the Rivers Edge West which used to be the Tamarisk Coalition he has funding from them mm -hmm. and, and I'm not sure how um, Tony with the sovereign lands coordinator, I'm not sure how. I don't know why they included all 5,000 in the in the letter in there for that because they told us it's only $2,500 for this project. And so it seems like I read somewhere that the total project cost was going to be. It's a little over eight eight thousand dollars, eight thousand something, whatever the. Twenty-five 58. of which is Dr. Tim Graham. Pardon? Right. Twenty. No. No. Ex that excluding excluding the 2500 for Tim for Tim Graham. Okay. You add the 2500 to the 5800, and that's what it would cost to do this project. And I'm just trying to was trying to address what how they had written the five thousand dollars in there that that's not going to come to the council for the additional. I'm hoping it will come for the full five thousand. Otherwise, we would have to do a contract with. With Tim Graham. Okay, so Tim Graham is not part of this project? Right. Okay. Parallel project. Then I guess the numbers make sense. <laughs> so you're, you feel comfortable? Yeah. Okay. I was confused too. Uh, after our last meeting and seeing uh, the rates that. Uh, uh, sorry, I just spaced the name. Uh, Seeing your rates, I think we're getting a steal, so I'm all for it. And the motion was to amend? To amend the budget, yeah. not to, right. so we can show it as a line item exception. So we know where, where it why, why it was there. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Passes five to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Roy. Okay. Uh, we already have done item number P, so we are at the consent agenda.
consent agenda is ratifying the chair's signature on a road project agreement between Grand County and USDA Forest Service, approving applications for retail beer license for the American Alpine Club Kragen Classic on uh, October 26th and 27th, 2018, located at Cane Creek, Cane Springs. Madam Cap Chair? Yes. We may have skipped um, the approving recommendation. Oh, we did. Approval. We did. Thank you. And that was, I was really excited about that. <laughs> so I apologize. I'm going, oops, looked at it wrong. Okay, Q. Wait. We did Q. It's Q. It's, he's, oh, it's just, okay. It's Q on the amended agenda. Okay, that's it. It gets confusing when you have an amended agenda. Uh, this is a once in a lifetime uh, award that uh, people in livestock and uh, conservation and ranching get and uh, it would be really exciting to see someone from our county receive it and I think Dee Taylor you know, would be is an excellent candidate. Yes? I move to approve the recommendation of D. Taylor for the Leopold Conservation Award and authorize the chair to sign all associated documents. Okay, motion by Jay Lynn Hawk, seconded by Rory Paxman. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? And thank you. Skipped right over that. You want to call be that good. vote? Huh? Do you want to call it? So, pass five to zero. Thank you. So, we'll sign it and I will send it off to the application board and we will be one of the people, one of the agencies that recommend that. Okay. Uh, consent agenda and agenda. Uh, ratifying the chair's signature on a road project agreement between Grand County and USDA Forest Service, approving application for beer license, retail beer license for the American Alpine Club, Crag and Classic on October 26th and 27th, 2018 located at Cane Springs Campground, approving chair's unsworn declaration on statement of water user claims for water right number 05-24, water right number 05-239. Approving application for retail beer license for the American Alpine Club. Okay. Uh, remove that from the agenda since it contains the council person's name and that council person would probably wish to recuse himself. That's my motion. <laughs> to, to remove it from the consent agenda. From the consent agenda. Yeah. Take it off of the consent agenda and okay. consider it separate. Okay, so the consent agenda would be ratifying this, uh, the roads project agreement and the approving chair's unsworn declaration on water user claims. And that item S will be considered after consent agenda. Is that what you would like? It's a, so the motion is to move item S out of the consent agenda. Do I have a second? I'll second that. All in favor? Or any discussion? All in favor? Passes 5 to 0. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Motion by Jay Lynn. Second. Seconded by Patrick Trim. Any further discussion? Yes. Yes. Um, on the road project agreement, I wasn't clear. Does that, on, this must be for a specific project. I just wondered, does this agreement do something new that wasn't outlined in the 2017 agreement that's referenced in the background? And sorry, I wasn't here to look at this, but my guess is since the project title is Grand County Road Stabilization, it's specific to that project. Um, and it is tied in with the cooperative agreement of May 31st of 2017. But I have not studied this. Okay. And my other 
question was on the water rights thing. Who are C.A. Hammond and Addie Wesson? So those are the, if I may answer, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. um, my hope was to have done some research on those and had a write-up for you all to explain that. And being gone, I didn't do that. But we have to have these done by the first week of August to be on time for this adjudication. And so I went ahead and had it on here because either way, the regardless of the research that we do, the chair still has to sign this. Mm -hmm. And then if there's any change, it goes through a different process. Um, so my intention is to answer that question before our next meeting has that. Uh, but those are the names that do show up on those water rights historically. Uh, Along with Grant County, right? Well, they must because Grand County, it's who received it, so. Right, okay. Yeah. Our rights get very confusing. Any further, any further questions? Okay, questions? All in favor of approving the consent agenda? Motion passes five to uh, zero. We are now uh, and then may approved. I make yes. a motion? Um, I move to approve the application for retail beer license for the American Alpine Club Crag and Classic on October 26, 27, and 28, located at King Springs Campground and authorize chair to sign all associated documents. Do I have a second? Oh, sorry. Okay, motion by Jalen Hawk, seconded by uh, Patrick Trim. Further discussion? All in favor? Okay. Four? Uh, in favor? I'm recusing myself because of my association with the Alpine Club. Okay. And one recruit. Uh, uh, Evan Clapper will recruit, is recruiting himself. So the motion passes for to zero, right? With the recusal? Four to zero with one uh, recusal. Okay. Uh, calendar items? Oh, that's me. <laughs> Excuse me. So here we are in July. On July 19th, tomorrow, the Performance Review Committee meeting is canceled. I think there was a lack of quorum. Were any of you all assigned to that, or had you volunteered to be attending? I don't know. Well, I've lost if track. you had, you want to update your calendar and cancel that. Uh, we do have Pioneer Day, of course, the holiday. County office is closed on next Tuesday, the 24th. Um, not on the calendar, but very important, uh, Representative John Curtis will be in town. The joint meeting uh, on Monday, July 30th, will be at 3.30 till about 5 o'clock, really less than 5 o'clock. Here in our county council chambers, that's a joint meeting with Moab City. Um, the agenda has been approved, uh, hasn't gone out to you all yet, but I will get it out to you. And we had to approve it early because the city needed to publish it early for some reason. Then at 5, and I learned it's till 6.30, the congressman will have a town hall meeting at Star Hall. And really all they're asking us to do is help spread the word about it. They're going to have it on Facebook, or I don't know if it's Facebook, but social media. Uh, they've already made the reservations themselves for Star Hall. You know, they're asking very little of us, um, but anything we can do to help get the word out is really their request. We do want to have a big turnout if we're going to have a room for 300 people close to that. So that's the 30th. On the 31st, um, it's not showing on there because it just got changed today, but the Budget Advisory Board won't be meeting the August 1st, Wednesday. They're moving it to Tuesday, the 31st, and that's because of the clerk auditor hosting happening here in town. So that'll be 8.30 till noon. Now that will supplant your county council administrative workshop if we were to have one. So last chance. Last chance for county council to say, no, we have to have a workshop on the strategic plan because <laughs> The, the Budget Advisory Board, you, you saw, have, has done their work we to, do need to complete to and get the details. And so, yeah, so the County Council is will be the ones to fill out, uh, or at least this is the Budget Advisory Board's thoughts. The County Council would fill out the planning infrastructure details of that plan as well as the, I think it was political relations or something like that. So when we have a, 
all the county council members here. Maybe at the next meeting we can set a time to, you know, go do our do our workshop on the strategic plan. We could do it before the meeting on the seventh. What's the seventh look like? Yeah, we could. Does that work? Do it on at two o'clock on the seventh of August. I'd have to check the calendar, but I bet I bet it's available. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that works. Let's plan on that. Excellent. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Thank also you, on the thirty first. Thank you. So that was the seventh. Yeah, our first meeting. On the thirty first. Uh, the tailings committee. I just want to point out. Um, I believe with that being Lee Shinton's last day, there's going to be some kind of honoring of him. Yeah, we're at, going to at that meeting, right? We're going to have. I don't know yeah, if that was. Stupid. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I know uh, Dana Van Horn is bringing cake, okay, and I think we're going to have some other things to honor him. Like, is the county going to have like a like they've done in the past with people that retire? Well, it's not a true retirement. Uh, I don't. I don't know. That would be Zachariah's call, I guess, and and Lee. Um, yeah. So. Anyway, yeah, Lee was the only one ever in that position, which was created in 2009. So he's the only one that's done it. <clears throat> Gold watch. Pardon? Gold watch. Gold watch. I think Gold so. Gold watch. Very nice. <laughs> um, anything else for July? Let's move on to August. Um, I sent out an email for August 1st. There, uh, the state auditor is providing an in-person training for local government. They will provide an update. And a Q&A session. There's two different Q&A or two different sessions actually. One begins at four for an hour, and the other one begins at seven. And in that email I sent you, you can RSVP online to them and submit your question. Uh, so that is August 1st here in these council chambers. Um, I got it. The clerk auditor at 9 a.m. And then Thursday, uh, Zions Bank is having their sixth annual municipal conference at Thanksgiving Point, beginning at 7 in the morning. We get the invitation each year. I don't know if council typically goes, but that's certainly something to look at. Um, okay, let's see. We just added 2 o'clock to August 7th for the strategic plan, uh, part of the council workshop. Uh, let's see, what else do I have? I have a question actually on August 14th. It says there's a joint city county council meeting at the city chambers, and I, we must have set that up last time. Um, so it's still on there. I, I guess I'll confirm if they still want to meet, given that we've got this July 31st meeting. They may want to change. They may not want to do that. I don't know. Uh, of course, this July 31st meeting is not a continuation from that last joint county council meeting. Uh, let's see. The, July or August 23rd is another performance review committee meeting. Do we have a volunteer at 1.30 on Thursday, July 23rd to sit in and watch the process? Excuse me. Oh, the performance review for exemplary merit increases. And when is it? July 23rd, 1.30. Probably about to one. I'm sorry, August 23rd. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Evan? Unless you were chomping at the bit there, Mary. I think my few. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. It's uh, it's, it's interesting. Worth, it's worth doing for sure. Uh, sorry, what was the time on that again? One thirty. Anyone else for uh, July? Or sorry, August. I'm stuck on July. August. Okay, employment opportunities. Most all these closed July 31st, but the first one we we lost our administrative assistant at the Old Spanish Trail Arena. What? Yep. So, um, what is today? The 18th. Two Can more days. It's her last day. last day. So the Osta Arena and Ball Field are down to two staff. We have. So we do have some um, applications in for that position. Good. Uh, at least, and that one closes July 27th. Other than that, we have uh, EMT Basic, EMS Paramedic. Both of those are part time. Assistant Food Service Manager in the jail, Corrections Officer for the Sheriff's Office, Patrol Deputy, Communication Slash Dispatch. We're also still looking for the Arena Facilities Maintenance Technician. That was the person who really did great work in the ballpark and the watering and all that. We have not replaced that one. 
Obviously, the technical inspector entry liaison. It looks like we have somebody. Weed Tech, uh, this is the grant funded position that you all approved recently. That's all I've got on that. Um, and then special events, nothing in July. August uh, 11th and 12th is the Ute 100 uh, permitted, and August 27th through September 14th is the Moab Music Festival, which is pending. And then finally, we have a summary of um, board openings. That would be the Historical Preservation Commission has one. Uh, most of these are term expiring end of this year, so they're midterm, but one, this one, Historical Preservation, expires end of 2021. The others are the Travel Council Board, the Rec District Board, and the Cemetery Maintenance District Board. And that's all I have. So if you all can help spread the word on those boards, that would be helpful. They apply through our office. Thank you. Okay. They are, we do not have public hearing, uh, closed session. Um, There's item V. I'll yeah, be discuss I'd on, make a oh, and I'd, to, I think he's, no. Yeah, I'd make a motion to postpone item V and include it on our next meeting agendas. Uh, it's just a discussion item. Right. So. Did you on, say postpone to next time? Yeah, please. Maybe you want to make a postponement definitely. Uh, postpone it then. Yeah. Indefinitely? So yeah, because yeah. we don't know when he's going to want to do it. And I'll research for that. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Motion to adjourn? Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Passes unanimously. The time is uh, 2.25. It's going to be weird to go outside. I know, it's going to be so weird to be hot and stuff. Uh, Dusk.